Nilly. I'm good. Help me with him. Let's get this off. Medical. Got one wounded at my location. Carter. You don't look so good. You gotta be more careful. I just got here. I'm not ready to see you two get blown to space dust just yet. Now let's get you down to sick bay. Great. Status report. The repair crew made it inside. EPS flow is back to nominal levels. The SIF is back up. How does this affect mission readiness, Mr. Ermat? Releasing the docking clamps using hull polarity minimized damage to the Resolute. We'll have some last-minute repairs to make, but if we reapportion some of the staff, we can make our departure on time. As of now, however, we are successfully moored to the station. Good to hear. Send updates to my ready room. Commander Rydek, with me. You disobeyed my orders. Well? I'm sorry for that, Captain. I you did what I thought was- You disobeyed my orders! And not just in front of the bridge crew, but the Starbase staff as well! That's going to get around. My name's already tarnished around the fleet. But what is it going to do to my credibility on this ship? From the top to the bottom. Bridge to lower decks. Captain, I told you I'd be honest, so here it is. Maybe I shouldn't have disobeyed a direct order, but you were wrong. You weren't on board, and you didn't have all the information. So I made the right decision for the ship. If you're worried about your credibility, put your ego aside and trust your crew. Trust me. You might have won some fans on the bridge with that stunt, but not everyone. Lieutenant Commander Chovak has already bent my ear. I'm sure he doesn't take it personally. He'll get over it in time. Mr. Chovak is more complicated than he would want to admit. I guess we all are. And... If I'm being honest, I'm not sure what I would have done in the moment either. You never really know if you weren't in those shoes. So, let's just boil it down to... You did what you had to. You placed a lot of trust in me, bringing me here. I feel like I've let you down. I brought you here for a reason. I'm still sure it was the right one. Despite it all, we got our final Starfleet clearance to depart. So if you'll fetch Mr. Ermot, we'll knock out the final details of any outstanding repairs, and then we'll set out for Hotari. Yes, sir. All departments reporting full mission readiness. We've got our full complement on board. This is my favorite moment, right now. The start of a new mission is always full of possibility. The Orion Syndicate could sell it as a drug. <laughs> Don't let the Admiralty hear you say that. Captain on the bridge. Sit. Sit, everyone. You all know, I'm not big on speeches. We're embarking on the first mission since our refit. Let's make it a good one. Disengage docking clamps. Docking clamps released. 
Thrusters ahead, Mr. Hendar. Thank you. I'm fine. Really, I, uh... You don't look fine. I have to get to sickbay. Go. Well, that was quite a scare. A few minutes more and it would have been one of the shortest tenures on record for a first officer. Is that the engineer that was out on the hull? That storm did a real number on him, but he'll live. Just needs rest. You should worry about yourself. Your deridium levels got dangerously low and destabilized your cell structure. This is definitely one of the more memorable first days I can think of. My name is Dr. Aram Duval, Chief Medical Officer. To be honest, I've never met a Kobliad before. You're... Rare. I know. I was going to say special. Your people's numbers have dwindled, despite the Federation's efforts to find a more readily available alternative to the Deridium you need to survive. Yet you joined Starfleet, and managed to thrive. I imagine the responsibility must be overwhelming. Maybe even a burden at times. It does make me unique, but it's not a burden at all. I'm honored to be Kobliad, to represent my people. As you should be. And don't worry, I won't treat you like a science experiment. I just do the science and leave the experiments to Solano. You don't agree with his methods? I don't agree with his definition of acceptable risks. Not when the lives of your crew are at stake. My professional opinion is that the accident took a toll. More than he's willing to admit. He's overstressed, operating in the pressure cooker of his own mind. Which is never a good headspace when the lives of your crew are at stake. What concerns me is that now he's even further away from the thing he's been chasing his entire career. Breakthrough discovery. The major innovation. Something he can put his name on. But the more the time passes and the further out of reach it gets, the more risk he'll be willing to take. I hear you. But that's my job, isn't it? To make sure that doesn't happen. And we don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Which is exactly why I'm so glad you're here. We need you now more than ever. And I have to give you credit for what happened on the bridge. It took guts to defy a direct order. I guess word travels fast around here. It's a small ship, and everyone's curious about the new XO. 
Fortunately, your cell structure is almost completely stabilized. And I'll spare us both the lecture, but I do feel it's my responsibility to remind you, without regular infusions of deridium, you will not live. It's as simple as that. Understood. Then, my work here is done. Sorry, I didn't mean to be lurking outside of sickbay. I didn't want to intrude, so it felt more appropriate to wait out here. We were all worried about you. Or I should say I was. I wasn't sure what was happening at first. But then I realized it was your condition. I don't want anyone to worry about me. I'm gonna be just fine. This is part of who I am, but I've never let it define me. I get that now. And I promise I'll try not to let being such a jerk define me, either. You trusted my intuition earlier, with a deflector pulse. I felt I should thank you for that. Well, thank you for coming. Even though you didn't have to. I wanted to. Now, Carter, the emissions that gave you that burn are quite unusual, like everything else that goes with this storm. That's a combination of hyronolin and lectrazine to counter the radiation effects. That should help speed your healing. She's come by a couple of times to see you already. Be brief. It's good to see you awake again. I was starting to get worried. Not that you aren't in good hands with Dr. Duvall. You did take one hell of a shot, though. Come on, you know you can't get rid of me that easy. Don't push me, Diaz. You do not want to see me try. No, nope. <laughs> I am not getting on your bad side. I am a formidable enemy. <laughs> Millie was looking in on you too, by the way. But since it's just us right now, I... I had a chance to think about this while I was away. And I thought it was important that I just come out and tell you. Instead of tiptoeing around it. Or worse. Now, this is just a guess, but... You like me. Is that what this is? How'd you know? Must have been pretty obvious. Which is funny, because... Kinda came out of nowhere for me, at first. Well, you know... I was hoping. I guess that makes this a little easier to say. We've been really good friends for a long time. I want to see if there's more between us than just being friends. You don't have to explain it. I feel the same way. There is something between us. So, do you want to find out what that something is? If it's there for you, and it's there for me, why not give it a try? We don't have to put too much pressure on it. Let's just see where this goes. I like that. Definitely felt some pressure coming down to see you. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, the patient needs to rest if he wants to get back to his old self. Of course. I'll see you again soon. Approaching the rendezvous point outside Atari space. Helm, bring us out of warp. Dropping to impulse. Ionic interference surging, Captain. Shield integrity holding. We can take it. We are at the correct coordinates to meet the shuttle. Commander Rydeck, find us our diplomat, if you will. Aye, Captain. Let's reduce the noise. Filter out environmental signals. I can manually tune what's left for Federation signal types. I've located the shuttle. Opening comms. On screen. Shuttle to Resolute. Shuttle to Resolute. Debris field. Lost maneuvering. Losing. I can't get it any clearer. 
won't get a transporter lock. It's just not happening. Power up the tractor beam. We'll pull them directly into the docking bay. Diaz, you good to run the tractor emitter? Yes, sir. Uh... You sure? I'm sure. Come on, Diaz. First thing, lock onto the shuttle and stabilize the rotation. We're pulling in debris. I'm on it. Take out the shuttle. Diaz, the bridge. There's a large piece of debris headed for the shuttle. The tractor beam can't handle it. Can our shields take it? I believe so. Commander Ryder, plot an intercept course. On it. Here we go. Maneuvering thrusters bearing 53 Mark 17, 200 meters on an intercept course. Maneuvering. Got it. Whoa! Someone's working hard on the bridge. Shuttlecraft on board. Good job. We're on our way down to meet them. Terra firma, so to speak. Ambassador Spock. Captain, we'll be right down to meet you, sir. In that case, I will wait for him here. That, that was a bumpy ride. Are you all right, sir? There are some elements of space travel that I would prefer to have left in my youth. But I am, at present, unharmed by the ordeal. It appears I have you to thank for my safe arrival. Your assistance arrived not a moment too soon, if I may say so. Well, it wasn't all me. I got some help from upstairs. A bombastic approach to clearing debris. We thought we were prepared for our arrival in Hotari space, but it is evident my craft was not sufficiently robust for such intense ionic activity. The storm has been pretty intense. There was an element that was most unusual. Before you came to our aid, our maneuvering thrusters and impulse engines were rendered inoperable. So we attempted a short traversal at warp speed, only to find that we could not achieve warp at all even though our diagnostics computer showed no faults or anomalies. What do you make of that? When all indications say that warp speed is possible, 
but in practice, we find it is not. Well, this storm is one of the strangest phenomena we've ever encountered. It's disrupted other systems. Who knows what it might do to a warp drive? Yes, it would seem further investigation is called for. Take readings, run some additional diagnostic checks, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Quite logical, Petty Officer... Carter Diaz, sir. Thank you. Ambassador Spock. Excuse me. I'm honored to have you aboard. I'd like to get right to it. We're already behind. Ambassador Spock, my senior staff. It's not every day that a captain gets to welcome a Starfleet legend aboard. Hmm. You flatter me, Captain Solano. But legend implies the past tense, whereas I am very much focused on our present circumstances. I didn't mean to suggest you were stuck in the past. You're right, Ambassador. Not the most diplomatic choice of words. Your experience comes from the past. But our present situation calls for it. True enough. We were hoping you could fill us in on the details. We got the basics from Starfleet. Two formerly peaceful neighbors are now on the brink of war. Indeed. And the tension between them grows fiercer by the hour. Olydia and Hotari. The Olydians are the more advanced species. They made first contact with the Hotari over a century ago. This is Tau, the Hotari moon. It is rich in dilithium, and for decades, the Hotari and the Olydians have shared a mining operation there. The Olydians provide the technological resources, while the Hotari have served as the labor force. The stability of that arrangement was the source of their peace until recently. The Hotari have suddenly and forcefully seized control of the mining operations and expelled the Olydians from their system. That is the official story as told by the Hotari when they requested Federation mediation. But the details remain scant. Communications between all parties have been limited by the ionic interference. Hmm. Have the Elidians retaliated against the Hotari, or taken any action against them? Surprisingly, they have not yet responded in kind. They were open to a Federation presence, but it is unlikely the relatively primitive Hotari forces would stand a chance against the Elidian fleet in open war. Left unchecked, this conflict will result in more bloodshed, which is what we are here to prevent. And the dilithium trade hangs in the balance. Clearly the Hotari have been exploited in this relationship. Maybe we can persuade them peace is the more profitable alternative for everyone. They both profited from the mines. And for the Hotari, something is better than nothing. Peace is our objective after all. We can call it profitable or mutually beneficial, but at the end of the day, the Hotari are still being exploited for their own resources. True peace is not merely the absence of war. And as such, this conflict will surely come again. Neither the Elidians or the Hotari are members of the Federation, so we can't make them do anything. There is an additional complicating factor I should mention. In the past, the Federation has relied on the Elidians as a source of dilithium. That certainly changes things. The Federation sources its dilithium from a lot of places. Yeah, and this is one of them. So we've already played a part in this. Unfortunately, that is indeed the case, Commander Rydek. We're morally obligated to make this right. Hold on. 
Our only obligation is to negotiate the peaceful resolution of this conflict. Given the Federation's involvement in the Illidium dilithium trade, Captain Solano and I must make every effort to appear neutral in these negotiations. What worries me is if this whole thing unravels and we're at the mercy of the storm at less than full strength. We can't let it come to that. Considering what the Ion Storm has done to our ship and the Ambassador's shuttle, we have to assume the Illidian fleet has had problems with it as well. This recent surge in the energy disturbance temporarily levels the playing field. Commander Westbrook is correct. The energy anomalies around the Hotari systems have been noted in the past. But they have never been observed on the orders of magnitude we have seen in recent weeks. If it's keeping the two sides talking instead of shooting at each other, that actually helps us negotiate a peace. And we'll take advantage of that as long as it works in our favor. And when it doesn't? All the more reason to learn as much about it as we can while we are here. We do not want to be caught unprepared, should the energy anomaly continue to fluctuate. So I trust we understand our circumstances. We're operating on a strict timetable here, and we're going to be leaving for the negotiations shortly. Commander Westbrook, I want you to leverage our systems to investigate the anomaly from here while we're gone. Aye, Captain. Thank you all. Dismissed. I want to speak to both of you privately. Ambassador Spock, I'd like to make a formal introduction. My first officer, Commander Jara Rydek. Commander, as you are aware, there are limits to what Captain Solano and I can do in our official capacity as representatives of the Federation. But someone in an unofficial capacity, your first officer, for example, would not be bound by those restrictions. Commander Ryder could ingratiate herself to certain parties behind the scenes, where they may be more candid in revealing information that could lead to a resolution. She certainly goes her own way. Maybe that helps in this case. I'm honored to be included in the negotiation process. You're not just included. You are instrumental. Well, I hope Commander Rydek will have more luck finding out what really happened than we will through official diplomatic channels. The fate of the negotiations, the interests of the Federation, and the prospect for peace may very well depend on it. Mr. Diaz, I understand you have already discussed the warp drive failure with Ambassador Spock? I have. It is imperative that the Ambassador's shuttle be flight ready. I need you both to ascertain the root cause of the system failures he encountered. I'm surprised, Commander. I thought you would have wanted to work on Ambassador Spock's shuttle yourself. I respect the Ambassador and his many accomplishments. But I do not derive any satisfaction from interacting with his shuttle as if it were somehow transubstantiated through its association with him. Especially when I have the entirety of this starship to concern myself with. When you look at it logically, yes, it is just a shuttle. No different than any of the others. There is plenty that is different about it, and that is what you are to investigate. But please limit your findings to observable scientific phenomena. We'll try to restrain ourselves. Then I will leave you to it. Make note of any abnormalities in your report. Carry on. It seems like he's warming up to us. Yeah. Even Chovok has to look at that face and know you've earned some real respect. And I have to admit that I owe you one. You were right to make me go first. I don't know what I was thinking. You've pulled me out of trouble how many times? Call it even. Okay. At the very least, maybe I can track down that bottle of Saurian brandy you're still on the hook for. But first, we have work to do. Ready to go? 
All set. Let's run the diagnostic. So... I know about your talk with Miranda. You... you do? She sent me a Priority One dispatch right after your conversation. I'm happy for you. Both of you. <sighs> Thanks. But I'm only going to tell you this once. Don't screw this up. Because I would be very unhappy if you tried this out and then, I don't know, six weeks or six days later, I have to start splitting holidays between the two of you. All because things went south and you're not on speaking terms. That just isn't gonna work for me. You really don't believe in me, huh? It's not you. Or her. Just running the numbers and things don't work out more often than they do. I like my friends and I like our group. I don't want to lose that. Is that thing done? Yeah. yeah, it's wrapping up. Let's see. The relays along the primary EPS are blown, but the backup relays are all intact. An EPS overload from the warp drive could cause that. But how did the shuttle end up dead in the water? Huh. Well, maybe the ship's data recorder can tell us something. Here. They were only about eight minutes from their plotted warp point. No faults, just those warnings. What are they? Subspace variants out of tolerance. What does that mean? It means the main navigation array lost sight of space somehow. Will the array going offline cause that? Yes, but it should have also thrown a fault code. The warp field became inverted suddenly. I've seen this happen when the center warp coil cracks. A cracked warp coil throws a fault code. Still, we should take a look. There was a complete warp cascade failure. Wow. They're lucky the shuttle didn't turn inside out. Makes me think the computer panicked on the warp field equation. Any one of these failures should have thrown a fault. If it was caused by a system failure. None of this caused the relays to blow. Roll forward to when that happened. Yes, ma'am. So here, they take a moment to get their bearings and they attempt to re-engage the warp drive. There. That's the relays blowing. And look, there's another warp system alert. Now they're all the same. Subspace variants out of tolerance or warp inversions. Finally, there's a complete warp cascade failure. Then it's one of two things. Either a warp coil is cracked or the navigation array is offline. That makes sense. Divide and conquer. You want to check the warp coils or the navigation array? I'll check the other. Let's not overcomplicate this. One of these systems is likely broken. I'll check the nacelles for a cracked coil. I checked every coil on the port nacelle for imbalances. If any coil in either engine were cracked, I would have detected it. So, it must be the navigation array. Except it's not. Checked and double-checked. Well, the readings don't lie. Here comes the security detail for the way team. Hey. I'm not here. We're escorting the negotiating team to the surface as soon as they come down from the bridge. I don't want to interrupt some important work. I was just hoping to see you before I go. The captain and the others will be here any minute now. Should be an interesting ride down to the surface. Come on, I'm never too busy to make time for you. That's not true. 
<laughs> no. But I am glad you came by. Now that's more accurate. <laughs> I gotta be precise with you, huh? Hey, Maris. Aren't these those button pushers you're always hanging out with? And you're the phaser jockeys we always beat in Parisi squares, right? All aboard for Hotari! That another one of the captain's railroad things? <laughs> Gotta be. I just usually zone out by the time he gets to the whole, uh, steam engines were the warp drives of their day part. Get y'all later. You don't want to miss your train. I do have to go. Not gonna lie, I'd rather not leave right now. More important things on my mind. That was nice. Yeah, it was. Save some of that for when I get back. You've got a deal. Be seeing you. It's Lara Diaz. If you could float back down to reality, we still have a ways to go. All right, where were we? So, the warp coils in the navigation array are fine, but the nav computer doesn't seem to think so. I'm out of ideas short of field stripping the shuttle from bow to stern. You wanna take this out of the shuttle and throw it on the bench? Oh, real hands-on maintenance. I like it. Okay, the nav computer is patched into the ship. The ship's computer can double-check our work. If the shuttle's nav computer is putting out false data, we'll know it. Let's run through the shuttle's logs again. Running now. Same. Warp field inversion and a cascade failure. However, the Resolute computer doesn't show the same subspace variance. We're in the same conditions that the shuttle was in when it failed. Why wouldn't the ship's computer get a matching result? What if the subspace variance was a momentary occurrence? That's a possibility, and it would explain why the simulation under our current sensor readings failed to reproduce the issue. But a subspace anomaly strong enough to cause a warp field collapse would leave graviton ripples for days. Let's run with the momentary subspace variance theory for now. Roll forward to the shuttle's attempt to re-engage the warp drive. We need the conditions of space around the shuttle at the moment of warp failure. Resuming simulation. Error in warp field calculation. Cochrane formula variables are out of range. That right there. Take the shuttle sensor data from that moment. Computer, why did the warp field calculation fail? Warp field pressure returned non-orthogonal. Results are undefined. That doesn't help. Wait, what if we use a different ship? Put the Resolute into the simulation instead of the shuttle. Yeah, it should warp just fine. Unless... Computer, run the simulation with the Resolute. Resolute simulated. Computer, give me manual control on the warp power. Static field intensity, warp 1.1. 1.2. 1.3. Warp pressure is destabilizing. Error in warp field calculation. The warp drive has experienced a system-wide cascade failure. Warp field collapsed. Subspace variance is out of tolerance. Cochrane formula results are undefined. Bingo. what -o? The same moment when the shuttle failed to warp, so did the ship. Whatever happened to the shuttle just happened to us. The Resolute will not sustain warp. We can't leave Hotari space.
Ambassador Spock, Captain Solano, welcome to Hotari. We are honored you've come. My name is Tylus Altaris, Minister of Diplomatic Affairs. The honor is ours, and this is Commander Jara Rydek, first officer aboard the USS Resolute. You'll find she has a keen mind and unique insight into the dynamics between the Hotari and the Lydians. We are honored to be here as representatives of the Federation. I'm so glad. These must be the representatives of the mighty Federation, the reigning authority in the galaxy. Or so we've been led to believe. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But either way, we're grateful you've made the time to come to our little corner of the universe. And you are? This is Galvin. And this is Citron, the heroes of the revolt in the mines. Let's hope this is the last time we ever have to come here. If you'll excuse me. I think we're about to begin. Did you hear the arrogance from that guy? I don't know what we're walking into here, but that guy was something. That may be true, but let's keep an open mind going into the negotiations. Hopefully he's just one voice amongst many. Then let's hope he's the outlier. The Hotari have invited us as their guests, so we must show them the proper respect. Ambassador Spock, welcome to Hotari Prime. The honor is mine, Your Majesty. That the Federation would send one of their most respected representatives is not only an honor to the Hotari people and their queen, but a recognition of our stature and importance. Let's get on with it, shall we? With all due respect to the Federation and their ambassador, they have no authority here. We are not members of their alliance. We are not subject to their rule, nor yours. We demand the immediate return of all mining operations to Elydian control, as it has been for centuries and will be for centuries more. That has always been our understanding. That understanding has changed. Then you invite war. And if you cannot remain silent, you will be silenced. But his point is well taken. What is the Federation's interest in this matter? Perhaps you would have us trade one oppressor for another? The Federation remains neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution of this conflict. We are here at your request, Your Majesty. For now. I'm trying to keep an open mind here, but it's not easy. I thought they wanted us here. Was there something you wanted to say, Captain? Oh, no. My apologies. And what about the Cobliard? She's not part She can of... speak for herself, can't she? Then let her. Now then, what is your name? Commander Jara Rydek, Your Majesty. Being a Kobliard, you would know better than anyone. Your people suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the Cardassians. 
Their injustice towards the Kobliard is as unimaginable as it is unforgivable. Not unlike how we have been treated by the Alidians. As much as they'd have you believe they are the victims here, remember it was the Hotari who attacked us. Hundreds of innocent Alidians were slaughtered without mercy in those mines. The blood is on their hands, not ours. Quiet! If after all the Kobliards suffered, you finally had the chance to right that wrong, to get out from under their control, would you take it? Or would you negotiate a peace? There is no remedy for what the Kobliad suffered. And I fear who we might have become in pursuit of it. There is no justice if the oppressed become the oppressor. So I would willingly accept a peaceful resolution if it were offered. That is the real opportunity. Perhaps, Commander Rydak. Perhaps. Unfortunately, that was not the case, was it? No. It was not. Peace is often elusive to those who need it most. The Federation is the most powerful, most advanced alliance in the galaxy. It's widely known we have an abundance of dilithium in our minds. And it's in your interest to secure a steady supply. Your Majesty, if I may. Ambassador Spock would have us believe you're here as a neutral party in the interest of peace. So why are you really here? I want the truth. Not your Federation rhetoric. It's possible the Federation has an interest in both peace and securing a steady source of dilithium. One does not preclude or prevent the other. But that's just my personal opinion. Given the Federation has done business with the Elidians for decades, I would agree. It's entirely possible, if not highly likely. What they haven't said, but cannot deny, is a simple truth. The dilithium trade would not and will no longer exist without a Lydian involvement. We created it for the benefit of everyone, especially the Hotari. We've given them warp technology. We've let them share in the profits. We've made their lives infinitely better than before dilithium was discovered. All of that goes away if the Federation turns a blind eye to their treachery. That is enough of your lies! The Hotari are quite capable of running the mines. We've done so for centuries. So tell me, who deserves control of the dilithium trade and the mines on town? Who should the Federation recognize? The Hotari or the Alidians? It can only be one or the other, not both. If I have to choose only one, then it would have to be the Hotari. Well said. How could the just and wise Federation make any other choice? This is an outrage. The Federation has lost all credibility. The mines are ours. Lydia will not be deterred. We will take back our mines by any means necessary. Then you will see more blood spilled. I am more than willing to address your concerns, Your Majesty. Yours as well, Representative. But I suggest we could have a more productive conversation with a smaller group. Perhaps only the most essential representatives. I suppose there is some sense to that. I hope we meet again, Jara Ryder.
Spock and I will cover everything on the diplomatic front. You make nice with the locals and see if you can get some answers. We need to find out why the Hotari are so willing to risk war. What happened in those mines? Hmm. Soothing. Commander, I'm glad you've chosen to side with the Hotari. I knew the Federation would see through the Illidians' baseless claims and protect the interests of my people. Even though the Hotari should have control of the mines, some of the Illidian claims are still valid. There you're wrong, but... We can agree to disagree. I assume you were there the day the mines were seized from the Illidians. Not seized. Reclaimed. And restored to their rightful owners. Yes, I was there. We had to be decisive. Before the Illidians could even realize their worst nightmares upon them. I'm curious. Why the Illidians haven't fought back. They have the ability to retake the mines any time they want. Ability is one thing. Courage is another. The Illidians know any hostile action on their part will not end well. They respect one thing above all else, and that is force. The greater the force, the more certain the outcome. Any talk of making peace is just that, and worth little without the strength to secure it. Which makes me wonder about your ship, the Resolute. Undoubtedly the Federation's finest warship. Ready to contend with anything the Illidians might have in store. Or is that not true? Maybe I've misjudged it. It wasn't designed as a warship. More for scientific research and exploration. But the Federation must have ships designed for war. Technically, they are Starfleet ships representing the Federation. But yes. I see. Sidron. A pleasure meeting you, Commander. I'm sure we'll cross paths again. Commander Rydeck, I'm encouraged to see the Federation supporting my people. I'm afraid of what might happen without your help. If anyone deserves thanks, it's Ambassador Spock. No one is more invested in negotiating a peaceful settlement to this conflict than he is. I'm so glad. We need his help before the situation escalates further than it already has. It's been... very trying. I saw you speaking with Sidron. Our national hero. I'm curious, what did he say? He seems to be of the opinion that negotiating for peace is a waste of time. Because force is the only blunt instrument he understands. He's a miner, not a diplomat. For the first time in our history, the Hotari have the upper hand. We see ourselves as strong instead of downtrodden. New voices have risen up. Old voices shouted down. Galvin and Sidron have become national heroes. Now, they have the Queen's ear. Better or worse, depending on your perspective. I get the sense you don't exactly trust them. I don't trust their instincts, which are leading us to war. My fear has been that the Illidians will launch an attack and crush us. You've seen their starship, no doubt. They could have retaken the mines whenever they wanted to, but it never happened. And as strange as this may sound, I'd almost say they're afraid. I just 
don't know what they're afraid of. It's still the same bluster and bravado you would expect from them. But it has no teeth. Like they're afraid of what might happen. Do you think it has something to do with the Ion Storm? Right now, it's stronger than ever, isn't it? It's entirely possible. I'm not a scientist, but I do know the storm has knocked out all kinds of systems. So maybe the Illidians weren't willing to risk their ships, given all the interference. Since the day of the revolt, Galvin has seized control of the mines and restricted all access. No one's allowed without his personal authorization. And they've taken over a section of the palace with just as much secrecy and security. I'm told it could be something they brought back from the mines. I've made inquiries, but everyone pretends it doesn't exist. I strongly suspect they're hiding something. What do you think it is? I've heard rumors it's some sort of ancient artifact, but I haven't seen it myself. How can we know? I'd better see what's happening. Do you think you can find out what they're hiding? I need to see proof of something before I can make my case to the Federation. I can try, but even if I found it, I might not know what to make of it. Take this. You can use it to capture whatever you find, and then send it to me. Thank you. I will let you know what I find. And I look forward to our meeting again. Sorry, I couldn't help but notice you were speaking with the Hotari this whole time. I figured in the interest of fairness, I should offer another perspective. Of course. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but these negotiations rely on the Federation's neutrality, as does any hope you might have for a supply of dilithium in the future. So why you would choose to side with the Hotari escapes me. Without a Lydian involvement, there is no dilithium trade. But clearly, you weren't aware. We are and will remain completely neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution to this conflict. As is ours. Of course, the question is, at what price? A major Sarlet Arminta, Special Attaché, Elidian Armed Forces. Pleasure to meet you, Commander. I have my issues with the Hotari, but I have to give them some credit. They know how to seize an opportunity. Inciting an uprising the same day as a massive once-in-a-lifetime ion storm. Our assumption was that this storm was just an anomaly. Yes, a very convenient anomaly. At least, that was what we were told. Of course, I wasn't there. You sound skeptical. Well, the official story is that it was the storm that enabled the revolt. How else do a bunch of unarmed, unorganized miners seize control of an entire moon, much less thousands of mines? But I've talked to people who were there. They tell a different story. They say they're lucky to have escaped with their lives. That it was more than just the storm. That somehow the miners were able to harness the energy from the storm. I know it sounds crazy. I'm not even sure I believe it myself. But that's what they said. You just answered your own question. How do a group of miners do something that in theory can't be done? That's how. Harnessing the storm. But even if it's true, how does that even happen? You tell me. If you'll excuse me, Commander Ryder. Well, that was a disaster. What happened? The Hotari refused to concede anything, so the Illidians stormed out. 
the Hotari did not invite us here as peacekeepers. I hope your efforts were more fruitful than ours. Gravitational harmonics failing to resolve. Warp bubble stability degrading. Increase output to maximum. Increasing warp output to maximum. It's happening again. It is evident that presently, the Resolute cannot achieve warp propulsion. Since our diagnostics rule out any problems with our warp systems or anything about the ship, the problem appears to be the fabric of space itself. Space itself? You're saying something about this region of space prevents warp travel? Prevents it, or can't sustain it. However improbable, that appears to be the case. The storm didn't stop us from leaving space dock and traveling here. But could it still be causing this interference with warp travel? We must follow sound investigatory principles. Do not let an assumed conclusion drive your analysis. Sometimes we need a little inspired thinking, Mr. Chovak. Captain Solano is on his way back from the negotiations, and I want to have some answers for him when he gets here. Indeed. Given the facts at hand, we may be able to deploy subspace probes around the ship to construct a clearer picture of the phenomenon. Around the ship. I'll prep a shuttle. setting up a waypoint at a distance roughly corresponding to the edge of our warp field. When we get there, I'll deploy the first probe. Westbrook. The Resolute systems are calibrated to receive the probe's readings. We are standing by to reproduce the warp field collapse after the first probe is deployed. Thank you, Mr. Chovak. We'll be in position shortly. And, Mr. Diaz, do take care in piloting the shuttlecraft. Now is not the time to indulge in the human penchant for joyriding. Chovak probably isn't such a fun guy to work for, huh? Nah, Lieutenant Commander Chovak's not so bad. You know, once you get used to him. And, uh, I've learned a lot working under him. I have a feeling I'm going to have to work harder to be a political animal like you, with this new first officer coming aboard. This is far enough. Transporting the first probe into position. Westbrook here. The first probe is deployed. Understood. We are reading it. We are about to replay the simulation. Don't get me wrong, things are definitely trending up with Commander Rydek. She's put my ideas into action. And she listened to me when your life was on the line out on the hull. That sounds like a good thing. It is. But I'm still trying to figure out if she's right for the job. She didn't go through what the rest of us did. Still got chosen to be number one. Can't tell if she was actually siding with me. Yeah, but she's lucky she didn't go through what we did. You can't hold it against her. Actually, I think I can, even if I shouldn't. Test is running. Warp field collapse in three, two, 
one mark. Whoa. All right, that is definitely a problem with the fabric of space. We need to get another probe out there. With two points of data, the Resolute and the probe, we've managed to get an interference pattern. I'm setting a waypoint to a particularly strong area of interference. We'll deploy the second probe there. Listen, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice I wish someone had given me. Make sure you're never just one thing. And don't get so focused on what's in front of your face that you lose sight of the big picture. Before Rydex showed up, the captain pulled me into his ready room and told me he didn't think I had the people skills to be first officer. <laughs> what a load of crap. I mean, if he'd said that about Cholak, sure. Is that why you're being so friendly to me? Politics? That would be clever, but I think you give me more credit than the captain does. You're all right, Diaz. And you've got potential. You're a capable engineer. You're good in the field. Keep up the good work, and who knows? A solid jack-of-all departments like you could be Commander-in-Chief of Starfleet one day. Hell, Admiral Jellicoe started as a shuttle pilot. And there are places to go in the enlisted ranks, too. You know, I'd be the best leader Starfleet ever had. Lower decks always have to fix all the problems Command causes. Maybe I'd just save everybody some steps. Well, don't forget about us little people when you're running things. Of course not. You gotta remember where you came from. Here. This is close enough. Stop the engines. Deploying the probe. Westbrook to Commander Chovak. We're ready for another sampling of data. Very good. Running the simulation again. Warp field collapse in three, two, one. Mark. There it is again. I saw it. Seems to be directional. Well, what about the scans? Anything? Here's the readings in relation to our local space. We've got the Resolute, Otari Prime, and the probes. All this interference is overloading the sensor buffers. We're gonna have to triangulate the sensors manually. We got something. These markers indicate peaks in the gravimetric interference patterns. Let's see if I can find some more. Hold up. This is coming from the moon. A beam that blocks warp travel. Aimed right at us. Someone is doing this intentionally. I don't know how they're doing it. This is like nothing I've ever seen. Why would they be doing this? We came here to help these people. And now we're getting hit by some warp-killing weapon? Now, look here. There's our current readings of the ion storm. These concentrations... They line up with the interference pattern. The storm and this beam, they're coming from the same place. Carter, whatever petty local conflict brought us here, it's just a small part of something much bigger. 